Sure. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. <clears throat> Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Marissa Darden. I'm a, did somebody just say yeah? Okay, whoop, whoop, I'll take that. Uh, I am a principal at Squire Patton Boggs in the White Collar and Government Investigations Unit. I was an assistant United States attorney here in Cleveland for several years and a prosecutor before that. We're here today to talk about the impeachment process, which I think is a very obviously topical subject and certainly is on everyone's minds. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll have a better sense of the mechanics involved in the process, but also um, have a couple points of view and then um, at the end, I will sort of give the neutral, non-political, non-partisan, hopefully, um, summation, and we'll take questions. <clears throat> um, my main reason for being here, really, is just to plug the criminal law section. Technically, <laughs> this um, presentation today is not being put on by the criminal law section, but programming like this and others that we've been doing, um, we're really trying to revive the criminal law section. So if you are... Um, active, dues-paying CMBA member, thank you very much. And if you are so inclined as to join our criminal law section, you may do so by going online or also by calling the membership department at 216-696-3525. So please do join our, our group um, and look at, be on the lookout for additional programming that the criminal law section will be putting out in the forthcoming year. I'd like to introduce our speakers. To my right is Reginald O, who is a professor of law at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. He teaches constitutional law, legal profession, and civil procedure. He received his JD from Boston College Law School and an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center. His scholarship is focused on the meaning of equality under the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. He's published in the Fordham Law Review, the Wisconsin Law Review, the University of California Davis Law Review, American University Law Review, among others. His current research focuses on the central role that dehumanization plays in fostering inequality and discrimination and the possibility for law to effectively counter that. <clears throat> Our additional speaker today is Jonathan Adler. He's an American legal commentator and a law professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. He contributes widely to it contributes to the widely read web blog, The Volok Conspiracy, and is frequently cited in American media and has been recognized as one of the most cited professors in the field of environmental law. His research is also credited with inspiring litigation that challenged the Obama administration's implementation of the Affordable Care Act, resulting in the Supreme Court's decision in King versus Burwell. So hopefully we'll have a spirited debate. I believe remarks are prepared, and uh, Professor O, you're gonna go first, right? Okay, great. Um, just to let you know, I have class um, within a, about an hour, so I'll, I might have to leave a little early, okay? Um, teaching con law. Not impeachment yet, but that's on Thursday. Um, so uh, for my presentation, I'm going to try to make the case for impeachment and removal. Oh, I'm going to try to make the case for impeachment and removal of President Trump. And here's my thesis, and I'm borrowing from the whistleblower's complaint where he addressed the central issues um, that uh, he was addressing in, in the complaint. So my thesis is that President Trump corruptly abused the power of his office to solicit and coerce a foreign country to interfere in the 2020 US elections for his personal and political benefit. And more specifically, he engaged in a coordinated bribery and extortion scheme over the course of several months to coerce the country of Ukraine to publicly announce uh, and open up a fabricated corruption investigation into a political rival, Joe Biden. And in terms of extortion, I make the argument in terms of extortion and bribery that Trump extorted Ukraine when he illegally withheld and threatened to cancel 391 million in US military assistance unless Ukraine announced the investigation to Biden. And then he also bribed Ukraine by demanding an investigation into Biden in exchange for a White House meeting with him and the sale of Javelin missiles to Ukraine. And having committed bribery and extortion, those are impeachable offenses which merit uh, impeachment and removal. And the central theme underlying the argument and the allegation is that 
he used his presidential powers to further his personal interest, to benefit personally, and then he actually tried to cover, cover what he did up. Okay? And just from my assessment of hearing the evidence, the testimony, it seems like there's not much dispute over the facts. And so that there really seems to be a sense that there's strong evidence establishing quid pro quo, for example. The real issue then is, ass assuming those facts are true, do those facts give rise to, are they so serious that they give rise to impeachable offenses? And so that's, and I'm gonna argue yes. And so uh, what I'm gonna do is now, I'll talk briefly about the law of impeachment under the Constitution, then flesh out the extortion and bribery argument, and then talk about what I think one of the central defenses uh, that Trump defenders are presenting, and then respond to that defense, okay? So, uh, the relevant constitutional provision regarding impeachment, the impeachment clause is the president, vice president, all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanor. So treason, bribery, high crimes and misdemeanor, I think what ties these offenses together are several themes. One, it, they all involve abuse of power. Abuse of power and abuse of office. Bribery involves corruption. Treason involves betrayal. And all those themes ultimately, I think, uh, implicate a broader theme of breach of fiduciary, that what the Constitution is concerned about is breach of fiduciary duty. Okay, the notion that what a high crime is, what, what bribery, bribery is, what treason is, is the president breaching his fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of the nation and the American people. Okay, and so basically when he acts in for his personal interest, he's breaching that fiduciary duty and that is uh, an impeachable offense. And the other thing that I think uh, what makes these offenses um, meriting impeachment and removal is when a president commits those offenses, he's actually a threat to the nation and the nation's interests. He's a threat to democracy, rule of law, and even national security. And when you have all that together, breach fiduciary duty, all these harms, then that warrants, I think there's a strong argument to say he should no longer be president. Okay? And I think this is a central question, one of the central questions we can ask. Based on the offenses, can we trust the president to faithfully execute the laws, abide by the rule of law, and act in the nation's best interest? Can we, it's about trust. And if he's committed these uh, offenses, then it's a conclusion that we cannot trust him, and then he should be removed. Okay. All right, so that's the law. And then let me talk about his misconduct in terms of bribery and impeachment. So there's been an evolution in the discussion discourse over the nature of uh, his misconduct. There was a lot of talk about quid pro quo, right? Whether or not uh, in his interactions with Ukraine, uh, there was a quid pro quo exchange. And now the discourse has shifted and now uh, the Democrats are talking in terms of bribery. Nancy Pelosi explicitly made this statement regarding tr Trump's misconduct saying, he committed bribery and the bribe is to grant or withhold military assistance in return for a public statement of a fake investigation into the elections. That's bribery. And bribery can be understood in terms of the specific statutes dealing with bribery, but also a general understanding of bribery that the framers uh, understood. So the framers didn't think in terms of a specific statute when they put in bribery. Um, the argument is that the framers thought of bribery, broadly speaking, as con covering the corrupt abuse of power to obtain personal benefit. Okay, and under that broad understanding, that actually includes both statutory bribery and extortion. And so let me just quickly, the, there's a, there is actually a statute that are, he, Trump has arguably uh, violated. It's the bribery, federal bribery statute, 18 U.S.C. 201-B2. And it states, whoever being a public official corruptly demands, seeks, receives, accepts, or agrees to receive or accept anything of value personally, in return for being influenced in the performance of an official act has committed bribery. I think that ca captures, um, for example, his 
phone call where he asked for a favor from the Ukrainian president. He was basically bribing, uh, seeking a bribe from Ukraine, demanding an investigation in Biden in exchange for a White House meeting and for the sale of Javelin missiles. So the July 25th call, I think, is an example of bribery. Then let me move on to the argument that he also committed extortion. The general definition of extortion is extortion is uh, committed when a public official is seeking or receiving a corrupt benefit paid under an implicit or explicit threat to give the payer worse than fair treatment. So there's overlap between bribery, there's similarities between bribery and uh, extortion, but one of the central differences is that core, uh, extortion involves, often involves coercion. It's one party, the extorter, coercing the victim to do something against his or her will. Okay, and bribery on, uh, doesn't necessarily involve coercion. Often in bribery, you have, both parties are complicit in bribery, the briber and the one uh, accepting the bribe. Okay, so in terms of extortion, um, I kind of like the story, I like leading off with the extortion frame because it focuses on the coercive nature and the, and the fact that Ukraine was a victim in this exchange. That he, specifically the extortion was, he said, or basically he threatened to cancel 391 million in military aid unless they opened up and announced a fabricated investigation of the Bidens and also the 2016 election. And here, Trump was seeking a corrupt benefit, the fabricated investigation benefiting politically via a threat, threatening to cancel the aid and trying to get Ukraine to do something they really did not want to do. It hopefully, um, this part's not discussed as much in terms of the effect of Trump's misconduct on Ukraine. Ukraine did not want to open up investigation into Biden. They did not want to interfere into US elections because they thought they cannot go again, you know, basically, um, go against one of the major political parties in the nation. They wanted to, they want to remain neutral. And they were now being coerced at the threat of losing four, nearly 400 million to engage in something against their will. Now, there is a federal extortion statute, the Hobbs Act, and it, uh, arguably the, what Trump did doesn't technically meet the elements of the Hobbs Act because uh, under extortion, the Hobbs Act the extorter is seeking to obtain property from another, the person being extorted. It's not clear whether trying to get um, Ukraine to investigate Biden is property, is that he's seeking, uh, trying to obtain property. So it may not be a nice fit with the federal uh, extortion statute, but there are several state statutes, extortion statutes, which don't require seeking, uh, of trying to obtain the property of another. Um, there are several state statutes like Rhode Island statutes, which talks about uh, the language of the uh, Rhode Island statute says, states whoever malicious, maliciously threatens any injury to the financial condition of another with intent to compel any person to do any act against his or her will has committed extortion. That I think is evident in the misconduct that um, Trump was trying to get Ukraine to do something against their will to his benefit and that is extortion. And again, hopefully you can get a sense of the course of nature of um, the extortion um, violation, okay? And I think my sense is that the Democratic leadership is emphasizing bribery because bribery is actually in the Constitution as an impeachable offense. But uh, according to the framers, bribery and extortion were basically interchangeable. So if you're Find and um, if you find that he committed extortion, you're essentially finding that he committed bribery. Remember, I gave you that general definition, uh, which involves the corrupt use of power to obtain personal benefit as bribery. Okay, so that's the uh, argument. And then here's what I think is has been the central defense to that argument. The argument is that he didn't have corrupt intent. That yes, there was a quid pro quo but he was threatening to cancel, or he was saying, I'm not, we're not gonna give you aid unless you clean up your corruption. So it's the corruption defense that he did not seek something for his personal benefit, he was seeking for Ukraine to clean up the corruption to ensure that when the US gives them the, the funds that they won't be wasted via corruption. Um, and so it's really saying, what was he, what was he seeking 
from that quid pro quo, and whatever that was, wasn't corrupt. It was about Ukrainian corruption, not about seeking uh, help in terms of interfering, having Ukraine interfere into U.S. elections. And here's my response to that argument, the fact that basically saying the quid pro quo, there's no problem with the quid pro quo. The argument is that um, he, Trump could not, did not have legal authority to withhold the aid for any reason, whether or not it's, it's for seeking a legitimate, on a policy basis, seeking the end uh, to eliminate corruption by Ukraine or for a uh, private benefit. The withholding of aid itself was illegal, apart from what he want, wanted from withholding aid. And specifically, he arguably violated what's called the, the Impoundment Control Act of 1974. Okay, so what the Impoundment Control Act deals with is presidential actions where the president re refuses to spend appropriated funds, by con funds that have been appropriated by Congress. And the Impoundment Control Act was enacted in 1974 in response to Richard Nixon's abuse of the impoundment power, that Richard Nixon would systematically refuse to spend money that had been appropriated for various programs. And in response, um, Congress oh, nearly impeached him based, based on that offense, uh, using the, uh, refusing to spend appropriated funds. And then they passed the Impoundment Control Act to prevent future presidents from abusing that power. So under the Impoundment Control Act, the president is severely restricted in basically refusing to spend appropriated funds. Under the ICA, he can seek what's called a rescission or cancellation of appropriated funds or seek deferral or a temporary hold on appropriated funds. And the key part, deferral is a temporary hold, and that arguably was what was going on with Ukraine. The thing is, um, under the statute, you can only seek deferral for three reasons. One, because of budgetary contingencies to achieve savings and as otherwise provided by law. Those are just budgetary concerns. You cannot under defer withhold, withhold aid or funding for a policy reason, which is what Trump did. And it states explicitly, no officer of the US may defer any budget authority for any other purpose than those stated. Okay, and here's the key part about the, in terms of the violation. Under the statute, if the president is seeking to defer funding, withhold funding temporarily, he has to spend a special message to Congress laying out he's doing this and explaining his rationale. He did not do this. He did not send a special message. In fact, he kept it secret and tried to keep, keep it secret until it, it got revealed uh, in September. Okay, the other way, other possibility uh, for a president to withhold funding is through rescission, rescission, which is when the president is saying we should cancel the funding entirely. I don't want to spend the money, forget about it. If you seek rescission, same thing, you have to inform Congress via special message. And then here's the thing, Congress gets a special message and they have 45 days to act. If they do nothing, the rescission doesn't occur. Congress has to pass legislation to, to basically um, support the president's uh, decision to rescind, rescind funding. So basically, it's Congress's call to rescind. The president does not have any authority to rescind funding. And with rescission, he also did not, that was one possibility in terms of him withholding funding, but he didn't do that. He didn't give the special message to Congress. He kept it secret. So by virtue of not spending, sending those special messages to Congress, by not providing any rationale for either deferral or rescission, the withholding of aid itself was illegal. And I argue it itself was an abuse of power and it could be, an, that alone could be an impeachable offense. That he, and for about seven weeks he held up aid and it looked like uh, it got uncovered and he didn't willingly um, uh, release the aid. He did it under political pressure. And so if he did not have legal authority to will withhold aid, then he could not withhold the aid to further any purpose, legitimate or otherwise. And so that argument about, well, he was further corrupt, he was trying to end corruption in Ukraine, doesn't fly if you focus on the fact that he could not have withheld aid for any reason.
unless those were specified by statute, and he provided a special message to Congress, and he failed to do that. So I think that's my, um, one of the arguments to respond to his, well, my interest in the quid pro quo was a le legitimate one. I had a legitimate policy interest. So let me just uh, quickly conclude, um, just make some, a uh, few re uh, remarks and then turn over to Jonathan. I think we're folks, I think in trying to figure out what Trump did, the nature of the misconduct, calling it extortion and bribery, my concern is it doesn't do justice to the magnitude of what he did, his, the nature of his misconduct. I mean, we talk also, not just about in terms of the specific action, but that for several months, Trump and his aides were implementing a shadow Ukraine foreign policy that was informal, secretive, secretive, and it was focused on achieving Trump's personal goals and to benefit him personally, not for the nation's interest. And I think that needs to be conveyed when the articles of impeachment are filed and then debate occurs and then when the trial occurs uh, in the Senate. And in terms of capturing the magnitude, the, one of the arguments, the other argument for saying it wasn't an impeachable offense is that no big deal. They got their aid. Sure, they had to wait seven weeks, but it was not a big deal. They got their money. But during that seven weeks, uh, I think there was serious damage. One, uh, he undermined American foreign policy with respect to Ukraine and to Russia. Okay? And he's really damaged the reputation of the United States in global affairs. And by withholding aid, he was jeopardizing uh, Ukraine's war effort. And in addition, Ukraine's President Zelensky was just elected in May, I believe. And so he was putting enormous pressure on a new president who was a comedian before he became president um, to deal with this extremely difficult situation where Trump said, or I think Sondland said, that Trump wanted to put him, put Zelensky in a box where he had no choice other than to uh, announce the investigation into Biden. So I think we need to also really focus on the effect on Ukraine and that it was a big deal. Uh, and then finally, back to the question, I think uh, hopefully you, uh, I made somewhat of a convincing argument that it's hard, based on the misconduct, it's hard to trust the president with presidential powers, in particular with respect to foreign relations, and that his misconduct is exactly the kind of misconduct the framers were concerned about. The, a president taking, abusing the powers, his vast powers, for his personal benefit and not in the interests of the United States and its people. Okay. All right, then that's where I'll end. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Adler? All righty. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I guess initial disclaimer right off the bat, um, you're not going to get a ton of uh, debate um, from me. Uh, some of you know uh, I'm a founding member of a group called Checks and Balances that I formed with Don Ayer, Stuart Gerson, Kerry Cordero, George Conway, Orrin Kerr, and a few others. Um, uh, and. I'm on record in terms of what I think um, Congress should do. Um, but I do want to put this que these questions in a bit of historical context um, for several reasons. One is, I think, uh, you know, impeachment is a rare and extreme thing to do. It uh, doesn't mean we should never do it, but it is rare and extreme, uh, and it is rare because it is extreme. Um, and understanding why we have it and how it's been used, uh, I think is important in understanding how to distinguish between those things that are legitimately impeachable and those things that we just might find to be quite objectionable. Uh, and also because, although I, I am on record saying that, um, uh, there, that impeachment should proceed, I do think a lot of the arguments that are made in favor of impeachment are bad arguments, are arguments that are contradicted by historical practice, and that would set really bad precedents. And so, again, while my bottom line is very similar, uh, I am concerned that a lot of the things that we are saying and doing in the name of impeachment um, are really problematic given our, uh, uh, our constitutional order and the concern for the rule of law that we should have. And so I'm gonna try and spell that out relatively briefly and then hopefully uh, save a lot of time for um, uh, for comments, and in, in the process, I will I will also you know identify some reasons why um, uh, people may legitimately have um, qualms about proceeding with impeachment uh, at this time in this way. 
Um, but to start, let me say a little bit about kind of why we have uh, why we have this impeachment clause, where where it came from, um, uh, and, and why it's in the Constitution. Um, we know that the the founders, uh, in thinking about how the Constitution should be structured. At, during the experience of the Articles of Confederation, it was well understood that we needed an executive, that this kind of, this, this structure of government that we had under the Articles of Confederation where there was no federal judiciary and there was no meaningful federal executive didn't work. Um, and that there needed to be uh, an executive power. Uh, but they were concerned about it not replicating what they had, uh, ex many of them had experienced in uh, the United Kingdom or saw on the European continent, not wanting a monarch uh, and not wanting uh, a parliamentary system either. And so there was a lot of discussion and back and forth about how do you create an executive that is independent of the legislature, right, that is not a prime minister, as you see in a parliamentary system, but yet is not a monarch. Uh, and if you look in the debates and you look in the New Jersey plan and the various plans and, uh, that, that led to, to uh, what we see in Article 2 of the Constitution, you see these concerns um, uh, being weighed and being evaluated. And that's part of why we have the president that we have, right, elected through the Electoral College, not by the legislature, in part so that the president would not be beholden to the legislature. Uh, and then we, but at the same time, we see this impeachment mechanism which has already been described to you, which is in the hands of the legislature and not in the hands of the courts, which was also a very conscious choice. Right? Impeachment is not a criminal proceeding. Uh, it is separate from a criminal proceeding. Impeachment, as the founders had seen it or were aware of it having operated over the prior 400 years um, uh, in the United Kingdom, had never been purely or even primarily about um, uh, uh, criminal enforcement and um, impeachment as exists in the Constitution is distinct and separate from the ability of the legislature to adopt bills of attainder, which had accompanied impeachments uh, in England. Uh, and, and the legislature cannot ever do bills of attainder. Now, uh, the impeachment is further distinct and separate from any sort of criminal prosecution because impeachment uh, itself can can involve no other punishment beyond removal from office and, and it's a separate punishment that Congress has, the Senate has to also separately approve a disqualification from holding future office. So it is possible to remove, impeach and then remove and not disqualify from future office. In fact, we have one member of Congress uh, who's apparently under investigation again, um, who himself was an impeached and removed federal judge and then went back home to his district and got elected to Congress. Um, so that, that, that's something that requires separate. The Constitution provides that um, criminal prosecution is, is available after one is removed from office, but it is separate. Uh, so impeachment is this, uh, in, in many respects, this, this kind of uh, instrument of political hygiene in certain respects that is distinct from uh, criminal process, uh, separate from criminal process, but, but also designed to be a, a check uh, on uh, executive power. Um, the fact that it is distinct from the criminal process, I think, is important in two respects. One is whether or not a violation of federal law may or may not have occurred is, in my view, irrelevant. And I think the argument that uh, or, or trying to rest a case of impeachment on the president's violation of federal law is uh, unwise and perhaps dangerous, and I'll explain why, why in a minute. Um, uh, secondly, though, it is also the case that something that is solely within the president's lawful and constitutional power may nonetheless be an impeachable offense. That is to say, there are things that the president can do that cannot be controlled by Congress, that cannot be reviewed by the courts, that are solely in the hands of the, of the president, but that may nonetheless be grounds for impeachment. And the most obvious example that we have not yet seen, um, and hope we don't see, is um, uh, the president uh, uh, issuing a pardon uh, to protect the president's own um, political or other interests. Uh, it was quite explicit that that would be grounds for impeachment. Congress cannot condition use of the, uh, of the pardon power. Congress cannot constrain the issue of the pardon power. This has been litigated. This was litigated during Reconstruction. Um, 
Congress cannot try and get around the protection that, that the pardon power can provide someone. Uh, it is a power that in all meaningful respects is in the president's hands absolutely. Um, and it's not even, it's, it's not even, there's not even, um, uh, it's not even clear that Congress can even engage in oversight of how that power is exercised. Um, but if Congress believes that the president has pardoned someone uh, for the per for what are in a way that is sufficiently abusive to constitute a high crime or misdemeanor, there is nothing that would stop Congress or should stop Congress from impeaching on that basis. So, uh, if the president were to, for example, pardon uh, uh, some of the individuals that were prosecuted by Robert Mueller, um, it might be the case that that would be a ground uh, for impeachment. Um, there certainly is a colorable argument that can be made that statements by the president certainly su uh, suggested that individuals like Paul Manafort might be eligible for pardons if they do not cooperate. Um, so I think that's, that's important. In terms of um, the standard um, uh, treason bribery, uh, and other high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, there was a lot of debate and discussion about what the standard should be. Um, and it again reflected this, this concern the founders had about, about realizing they needed something. There needed to be a way short of election to remove a president and, or vice president from office, but also not wanting it to be just political disagreement. Not wanting it to be, I don't want to say partisan power play because they didn't quite anticipate the rise of political parties, but they were aware of factional interests and concerned that impeachment just be something that a legislature that didn't like the president would simply use. Um, and so maladministration, um, which had been grounds for some impeachments um, uh, uh, in England, was specifically uh, rejected as a possible basis. And the idea that high crimes and misdemeanors as a phrase would, in, would encapsulate this idea of, of abuse of power in a way that is uh, threatening to the nation as a whole. So for example, in Federalist 65, uh, Hamilton um, talks about the subjects of impeachment are those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. They are of a nature which may with peculiar propriety be denominated political as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. Um, and the idea there is both that there are things that affect the nation as a whole. This lang Hamilton's language is very parallel to some language that you find in Marbury versus Madison, when Marshall is trying to distinguish between those cases where uh, an individual's claim of right is involved versus things that affect the nation as a whole. Uh, but it also uh, embodies this idea that that if in, if the, if the demand for impeachment or, or recognition of need for impeachment is not sufficiently widespread, it's something that cannot and perhaps should not happen. Uh, and that is something that, that I do think we need uh, uh, to wrestle with. Uh, Edmund Randolph um, character said impeachable offenses were, uh, or the need impeachment was necessary was because the executive will have great opportunities of abusing his power, particularly in time of war when the military force and in some respects the public money will be in his hands. Uh, Madison argued that uh, impeachment was necessary for defending the community against the incapacity, negligence, or perfidy of the chief magistrate. Um, he might pervert his administration into a scheme of peculation, which is a nice uh, 18th century word essentially for embezzlement, um, or oppression. Uh, he might betray his trust to foreign powers. Uh, and what's interesting about the emphasis by Madison on relationships to foreign powers and Randolph's re reference to uh, war is that those are contexts in which we would expect the legislature to be less able to check the president than when it comes to domestic affairs. So one of the reasons I don't like talking about, well, did the president violate this law about bribery or this law about extortion or, or, or empowerment or whatever else is, um, we generally accept that presidents will often do things that are illegal. We see those cases in the Supreme Court all the time. We, those, aren't, those don't justify impeachment. Uh, we, Im impeachment is there in part to address the sorts of abuses that the normal interplay of the branches, and separation of powers, cannot address. Right, so the fact that the Obama administration lost more 9-0 cases in the Supreme Court than any modern presidency is not an argument that the Obama should have been impeached. That's business as usual. The executive branch sometimes makes a bad call, and if so, we expect that the other branches to restrain it. 
The point is, is that when it's dealing with areas where Congress is less competent to be involved, foreign policy, conduct of war, things like that, that normal interplay is less relevant. So also, to give another example, which may involve political advantage, right? We know the backstory behind the Youngstown steel seizure. Harry Truman did not want to piss off labor. He did not want to use the tools Congress had given him to prevent a work stoppage. For his own political benefit, he stole private property without legislative authorization. He thought that the court was going to uphold it. He argued it was related to the time of war. But our, because it occurred domestically, because it affected private rights that could be vindicated in court, we didn't need to talk about impeachment because our regular interplay of, uh, of, of, the, of the branches is sufficient to deal with that sort of offense. So even if you kind of take the, as I've just spelled it out, the, kind of the least charitable possible interpretation of, of Truman's conduct, not clear rises to impeachment, even though it was illegal. Uh, even though it, it, in many respects, violated trust, even though it was done for political benefit, not clear was the type of abuse that um, should justify uh, uh, impeachment. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I don't think we want to focus on the law-breaking uh, part. We want to uh, focus on those things that we justify at, or that we recognize as fundamental betrayals of the president's oath. Uh, which we have to also recognize is something that the president has as much right to uh, interpret as do the other branches. Uh, I'm a departmentalist, um, a separation of powers. Each branch is obligated to interpret the Constitution and act consistent with its own interpretation of the Constitution in the performance of its duties. This is why the Office of Legal Counsel writes lengthy memos interpreting the Constitution to guide executive action. This is why Congress should always consider the constitutionality of its actions before acting and so on, because not everything's gonna end up in court. So it's not enough that we disagree with the President's interpretation of, of his oath and, and how he's playing the Constitution, but we have to be convinced that it is in fact the sort of abuse and usurpation that is not explainable as a different conception of the scope of presidential power and not restrainable by the regular interplay of the branches, uh, whether it's uh, the legislative exerting its powers over the purse, its powers of oversight and so on, um, uh, and um, uh, judicial, um, judicial review. Um, a couple other super quick points because I want us to have a discussion. Um, the founders' conception of impeachment as as being the sort of remedy for the sorts of abuses that that threaten the nation in a whole or affect the nation as a nation, in their conception, which again was a was a perhaps naive view of the way politics would evolve because they did not anticipate political parties, did assume that that there would that impeachment would not occur on a factional basis, and we we face the reality that at least at present, views of impeachment are quite factional. And they are quite partisan. And that is a problem. It is a problem as a practical matter, because you're not going to remove, remove someone um, uh, on a factional basis. There have been 19 impeachments in our country's history, only two of presidents. Um, there have been eight removals total, all of judges, no removals of presidents. Um, uh, and so we know what the votes required are in the Senate. They're not there at present um, in a public vote, which there must be. I know there's this theory out there that you could have a private, uh, a non-public vote for impeachment. No, that's not going to happen. Um, uh, and so we, sh we should, there are, there are prudential questions about whether or not impeachment, given its political nature, is something that should proceed uh, if it can, if it, if it is or can only uh, uh, proceed on a partisan nature, and my own view, um, uh, one of the mistakes that was made by Congress is this game that went on for months about are we investigating impeachment or are we not? Uh, it led to legal problems in the courts. The one of the Mazars uh, the Mazars litigation that's pending before the Supreme Court now. The only reason that, this, that that case is an issue is because Congress refused to admit that it was in fact engaging in an impeachment inquiry and using its impeachment power. 
Right? The reason it was, that opinion was divided on the DC circuit was because one of the judges said, look, the wolf has to come as a wolf. If you're thinking about impeaching the president and, and seeking private documents on that basis, you've got to own up to it. You've got to say that's what you're doing. You've got to engage the public and the political process on that basis. And playing games like, oh no, we're really thinking about emoluments legislation. No, that's, that, that's, not, that's, that's not the way the system works. Um, but I also think just given the nature of impeachment, it, it, it's done us all a disservice because the magnitude of the, of the task and the, sort, the degree of political consensus that is necessary is not something that you're going to get when you approach impeachment on that basis. And, um, uh, and I think it only reinforces the arguments that were, were, ended up being persuasive in the context of President Johnson, that trying to remove a president on a partisan basis when there's an election coming up uh, is something that the political process is just not gonna be willing to do. So hopefully I've thrown out some food for thought and uh, happy to, to have further discussion and questions and the like. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of questions, um, two of which my grandmother gave me to ask, so <laughs> I must ask those. Yeah, they're good. Um, and then there is a microphone coming around, so um, um, be sure to wait until the microphone comes to you because this is being recorded so that we can have this. So if I may, before you ask your question, I'll interrupt with my grandma's question, which is, um, you ended, Professor, your notes or your, your thoughts by saying, you know, that there is an argument for or against those, that there's an argument that the election process should play this out. And so if you accept that this is a political, an inherently political process outside of the criminal norms, um, what, I'm curious about what both of your thoughts would be about whether we should be examining impeachment in parallel with the elections process, or whether there is an argument for the impeachment process handling claims or business that the executive branch isn't designed to function very much outside of the election of my personal representative or my president. Sorry, let me just start. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I, if it were all up to me, which is an academic, I get to kind of say, right? Um, uh, my, my students don't get to like vote me out, of, vote me off the podium or something. Um, not yet. Not yet. Uh, if we're up to me, the, the idea that the executive branch or executive, because impeachment doesn't just apply to the president, it applies to other executive branch officials. The idea that impeachment is always something there in the background that Congress should be concerned with, or with evaluating. Um, should be, in some respects, be, I mean, it should be constant. Um, um, what I mean by that is, is that um, we should expect Congress to always be wanting to ferret out um, uh, uh, malfeasance and to distinguish between things that are, are just maladministration and those things that are abuses of power. And if that is an ongoing process, um, then the fact that elections occur, yes, that happens, and yes, politicians are people too, and they're gonna be aware of that, but that 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 process does not have to um, uh, affect what they do. Um, that's a very idealistic view, right? Um, um, uh, we know that the executive branch tries to run out the clock on elections, um, uh, doesn't cooperate with congressional investigation requests, doesn't act on uh, contempt referrals. Um, all right, so. Uh, some members of the Obama administration were held in contempt by Congress, and those, those the contempt citations were referred to the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia, who um, did with them what uh, uh, James Madison apparently did with uh, William Marbury's commission. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's just the reality. The one thing that's worth third law joke, I don't understand. Okay, <laughs> round filed it. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> Or my, my younger daughter's a big Office fan, so it's, there's that episode where he's like, yeah, you put it in the special filing cabinet, the one that's round. Um, so, I mean, that, so, I mean, on the one hand, our elected officials are always aware of elections, and that's just the situation we have, and so we can't wish, it, wish otherwise. Um, on the other hand, you know, the system was, uh, uh, was, there's nothing in the Constitution that suggests it should be a, a separate standard. Last thing I'll just say, um, you know, there is an argument, a bad argument against impeachment made all the time, which is that it's undoing an election, right? Which it, it certainly now 
that we elect presidents and vice presidents as a ticket, which was not always the case, but we've done that now for 200 years, um, all you're doing is putting in the sub, right? I mean, so you're not, you're not turning over the government to the other party, um, which, which I would hope would make elections less salient to the impeachment process, because on many things, President Pence would do what President Trump does. He would talk about it differently. We'd have different press conferences, but, but the substance, you know, the Department of Education's policies aren't gonna change uh, over, dramatically if we have a President Pence instead of a President Trump. Um, which reinforces the idea that impeachment is about the abuse by the individual, not about um, uh, partisan power. I, <clears throat> I just respond by in terms of looking at the impact the impeachment has on elections, looking specifically at the Bill Clinton uh, impeachment. So regardless of whether or not um, they, should inter they should interact, they did in the sense that even though Clinton was acquitted, it arguably affected the way Gore ran for president. He's, he's tried to shy away from, stay away from Clinton, and he might have lost as a result. So th I think we cannot avoid the interaction between elections and impeachment. And um, it, I think the question, I think for the Democrats is, they, they want to do their, I think their uh, goal was to do this really quickly. They want to um, have articles of impeachment filed by before Christmas. I'm not sure how realistic it is, and I'm not sure that they, that's something that they should do. Um, and for very strategic reasons, but there is a danger that the clo obviously the argument for impeachment gets weaker the closer we get to election, right? Then people will say, what's the point of impeachment? Let's, let's decide this uh, uh, at the ballot. Um, so the Democrats have a kind of, um, they have to make strategic decisions. I just wanted to add to that. There, there's, a, there's an assumption, political assumption, that you can kind of only do impeachment once, mm -hmm. um, which is wrong. Right. Um, I mean, we don't have a lot of precedent, but the idea that Congress, the House could vote out one impeachment article next week, and then as they continue to investigate, vote out another one a month later, um, um, that's... I mean, there's nothing to suggest in, in either the history, in either the, the kind of the origins of the clause or the history of the practice to suggest that that's inappropriate. So uh, Congress is unlikely to have access to uh, Trump's business records until January um, at the earliest. Um, and maybe there, there will be evidence in those records of things that are impeachable. Um, that could be evaluated completely independently of Congress's assessment of uh, the relationships with Ukraine, or Congress's assessment of certain aspects of the Mueller report, which don't get talked about, like uh, telling the White House counsel to um, lie to file uh, for the purposes of misleading investigators, which is it, which is there, uh, which has not been denied. And um, as someone that 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 believed Bill Clinton should have been impeached, seems to be in that universe of things that the chief law enforcement officer of the United States should not be engaged in um, uh, uh, either personally engaging in deceit in a, in a judicial proceeding or obstructing a judicial proceeding. And um, you know, so there's nothing that would stop Congress from kind of acting on what it has and then letting other stuff play out and, and, and perhaps acting again if additional things are, are uncovered. Well, that leads me to Grandma's question, which was, what do you say to people who suggest that Trump's conduct in this way is really just business as usual, he's just getting caught, or is particularly flagrant about the alleged corruption, bribery stuff? Like, isn't this stuff that happens all the time? And he's just... Yeah bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the argument I have with people about Miles Garrett, right? Um, uh, Mason Rudolph should be suspended, but that doesn't, but the fact that he wasn't doesn't mean Miles Garrett shouldn't be suspended, right? I mean, oh, I disagree with that. Uh, <laughs> we evaluate, I'm not from Cleveland originally, I'm really an Eagles fan, so I can, I can say that. Um, but I mean, the, same, but the point being right is that, is that we have, you know, we know that some people get caught and some people don't, and we should evaluate uh, we don't want a situation where we say we excuse political uh, misconduct or malfeasance or abuse of office because we don't catch all of it. Um, my view is is that when you catch it, you should act on it. And 
um, and and for the same reason that you don't want to um, excuse it because over time, if you're in the process of excusing it, if you don't catch all of it, you're going to be excusing more and more and more and more. And you're going to be lowering our overall standard of what sorts of conduct we accept. And if anything, we should be constantly trying to have political figures act better, not act worse. And so that means acting when we catch it. And uh, if that means that there may have been prior presidents that did things that were impeachable and we didn't impeach them, well, then we should recognize that and, and pledge to better in the future. There's a question. Well, I just wanted to. Oh, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this is, I would tell your grandmother, this is very different. Um, this, I think one of the witnesses, the diplomat said, with respect to foreign policy, had you ever, they asked him, had you ever seen anything like the shadow Ukraine foreign policy? And he said no. Yeah. This is totally um, sui generis in terms of what's going on. And the fact that it deals with foreign relations, that's what also sets it apart. And in terms of things where separation of powers cannot deal with certain kind of presidential abuse, with foreign relations, the checks and balances are weak. And so this is where uh, the abuse of power is, the, the threat to the nation is strongest. And nothing like this, this is, this, uh, the fact that it deals with foreign relations is dealt with Trump's use of the sub his substantive powers. It makes it very different from, say, Clinton or even Nixon. And so I would say, no, this is not garden variety. Uh, not average visa. corruption. No, this is not average corruption. Okay. This is uh, extraordinary corruption. Very interesting. Thank you. Question. Given is this, yep. is, okay, given that, as you pointed out, the impeachment is not a judicial proceeding, mm -hmm. and it's definitely not a criminal proceeding, is there textual or, or uh, structural basis for the arguments that things like the Sixth Amendment confrontation mm -hmm. and uh, the rules of evidence apply in impeachment no, no. Um, but but uh, <laughs> let me uh, let me unpack it a little bit um, so I mean as a as a as a pure matter of of, con of constitutional law the understanding is is that um, the Constitution gives each uh, house of the legislature the complete uh, uh, discretion to set its own rules so this means to take actual cases that we've seen the House says this is the text of the bill that passed the House, that is the text of the bill that passed the House. And there was a case in the 1990s where it wasn't clear that what the House said had passed was actually what passed, and the court said, we're not touching that. Um, in the case of Walter Nixon, not to be confused with Richard Nixon, a judge who was impeached and removed, he argued that because his impeachment proceedings occurred in a committee rather than in the body of a whole in the Senate, that the Senate violated the instruction to try a case of impeachment, and the Supreme Court held that that claim was non-justiciable. Um, and Justice Souter wrote a concurrence saying, well, you know, surely if they did something like flip a coin, then, and, but the, ma the majority's dispute was not a committee's close enough to a trial as a full proceeding. The, the majority's view in, in, in that case was the courts have nothing to say about the conduct of trial in the Senate, let alone uh, the inquiry in the House. Um, beyond, certainly nothing about the internal operations of it. There may be questions about whether or not the House can obtain, can seek judicial enforcement of, of House requests for information. Um, that does not mean that there aren't norms or standards that it is legitimate to make arguments for, uh, either as a matter of historical practice um, or as a matter of underlying fairness. So, had Walter Nixon been removed on a coin toss, there would have been no judicial remedy. But it would have been legitimate to argue that that was either unconstitutional or contrary to the norms we should we would expect a constitutional actor to observe. So um, it is legitimate to say a fair impeachment will allow the following things. Um, and But that is ultimately going to be a political argument because the jury for that claim or the judge for that claim is the political process, not the courts. And um, we can recognize that um, some of those claims will find support in what was done in the Clinton, Nixon, or Johnson impeachments, and some won't. Now, so the, the particular Sixth Amendment claim, um, there's no... Pre, pre, uh, a precedent for saying that that should apply in the context of the House inquiry, which is kind of like a grand jury proceeding, but I emphasize kind of, in that the impeachment is like the indictment, whereas the actual trial's in the Senate. Um, 
Uh, but there are certainly all sorts of reasons why we would, we might, as a matter of politics, want all of the relevant factions, in this case parties, to have a, a, a degree in the process for its legitimacy. And we might think that insofar as some of that was allowed in prior proceedings, that we might want that to be allowed now. So it's really a political argument, um, but one that kind of resounds in constitutional values. And so it's, we shouldn't be upset that people point to those concerns. We should be upset if people overclaim Right. The Sixth Amendment must apply. No. The Sixth Amendment embodies certain values. Those values are important in our, in our conception of what a fair administration of justice looks like. Here is, it is legitimate to say that those values should be, should be replicated at some point in the process. And, and so as long as we observe those kinds of distinctions and how we describe it, it's legitimate to kind of raise the question. But no, the Sixth Amendment itself does not apply. I guess just one point when I think of kind of your question in terms of what is the process. It's not really a you know, trial in the criminal, and it's not a criminal trial. Um, the question that um, I think people should think about, especially the Senate, was what's the burden of proof? What's the, uh, is it, if it's not a criminal trial, it's not gonna, it doesn't have to be beyond reasonable doubt. If it's more like a civil proceeding, why not preponderance of the evidence? And the answer to this question is it depends on each senator. And so, um, but in terms of the public and as lawyers evaluating the strengths of the argument, you, I think it's clear it's not a, a beyond reasonable doubt standard is not required. And having can, taking into the consideration that it is not a criminal process, and that should factor in in terms of whether you find that he should be convicted of of um, of, of the various articles of impeachment allegations. And if I may just add one point to that, because the Sixth Amendment. I think it's also implicated in the right to confrontation and confronting your witnesses. And in the context, particularly of the Republicans, they've been really trying to out this whistleblower and actively publicly question witnesses about the identity of the whistleblower. And that could be a whole other hour long luncheon, uh, essentially. Um, but suffice to say that there are many federal and state protections that protect whistleblowers, both identity and, and their conduct. There's, I'm sorry? Oh, no, no, please. Uh, Anti-protection, um, anti-retaliation protections and other protections that really um, are designed specifically to encourage people to promote or, or request or, you know, out publicly these types of issues. And I think there is a very serious question for scholars smarter than me to decide about whether the Republican party and the, the congressmen on the Judiciary Committee are violating federal or state law by questioning some of these witnesses about their whistleblowers. And whether the Sixth Amendment contemplates or, uh, you know, is addressed in that way, I think, is also an interesting question. The speech and debate clause would protect them. Okay. We are uh, 45 years out post Watergate. So I'd like you to f fast forward 45 years from now. Uh, you know, the trajectory seems to be that it's going to be imp impeachment and then acquittal. Assuming the Republic, you know, survives, uh, what will constitutional law professors be teaching about this, about what's going on now? What's going to be the thesis? Good question. Assume, assuming it survives, which is, you know, an open um, question. Uh, well, it'll survive. But, um, uh, I mean, uh, I can't answer it at that level. I can tell you some issues that we're going to have some answers to, right? So we're going to know whether or not uh, executive privilege applies in the context of, of inner branch disputes. Um, you know, our, our, most, our most important executive privilege case involved a, a subpoena, a third party subpoena in a criminal case, in an actual criminal case. Impeachment's not criminal. Uh, we have lower court opinions where uh, congressional committees have tried to obtain documents from um, uh, the White House, and some of which have been successful, but we haven't had the Supreme Court on that, and looks like we're going to get something close to that. The, the Mazars case, which the Supreme Court has stayed, involves um, uh, the one that they've stayed, there's another one out there too, uh, involves a congressional subpoena to the accounting firm that has the president's business records, and the president has intervened trying to prevent that disclosure. And that case is, it, there's some other things that complicate that case, such as the fact that the memorandum justifying the subpoena 
made no mention of impeachment whatsoever and said this was purely about um, uh, Congress considering legislation, which is problematic on a bunch of levels. The idea that, that Congress can seek a single individual, even the president's private records, um, uh, for legislative purposes when you are not allowed to do bills of attainder um, uh, or adopt ex post facto laws, right, so punish things that have previously occurred, is something is a serious raises some serious questions, but but we'll know if there's an executive if executive privilege applies. We'll know a little more about those interbranch relations, uh, and that will be useful. Um, we'll be able to say more about what the precedents about impeachment tell us, insofar as we think that the historical practice by the political branches establishes norms that should be followed going forward. I guess I would say the question that comes to mind 45 years from now is, does if, in fact, he's impeached but acquitted, given the facts and given how I think the arguments for impeachment and removal are so strong, is if that occurs, is this an indictment of impeachment as a process, as a real viable check on presidential power? For, uh, not, never mind the judges, but in terms of precedents, it would be 0 for 3, right? No, no, um, no conviction, no impeachment removing, resulting in removal. Has it failed, or is that a uh, sign of that is working in the sense that you require a really, 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 really high, uh, very serious kind of conduct to merit removal? Um, so that's what I would try to. That's the question I'd ask and think about. And, wh and what if he's impeached, not removed, and reelected? I'm, you know. I'm just, uh, you know, it, it, that is not that is beyond the realm of possibility. Like, I think it's likely. We have a question in the back. Given everything that you've said, isn't it in fact the case that an impeachable offense is whatever the House of Representatives say it is, and a removable offense is whatever the Senate says it is, because the Supreme Court's not doing, going to interject, and unless the executive branch just simply stays fast and says, even though you've impeached me and decided to remove me, I'm not leaving, I mean, it's all up to the Congress, correct? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, yes, I mean, you know, we say about, you know, what I tell my students in con law is the Supreme Court's not final because it's always right. It's right because it's always final. Right, so the Supreme Court's decision on a case is what, what governs, but they sometimes get it wrong. And so while whatever the House is willing to vote as an impeachable offense, as a, pra as a practical matter, will produce an impeachment, um, I do think it's fair to say that there are things that some claim are impeachable offenses that aren't, given what we know the meaning of, of high crimes and misdemeanors was. I mean, it wasn't perfectly defined, but it covered a universe of things, and, you know, there are things that, that aren't, and, and, sim and similarly the reverse. I'm sorry? Well, the remedy is ultimately political in the sense that, I mean, if, 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 if Congress, um, uh, I mean, the remedy is political, but you know, I'm, I'm comfortable saying that constitutional actors sometimes exercise unreviewable constitutional power in a way that is wrong, right? There are Supreme Court decisions that I think are wrong. They got the Constitution wrong, and hopefully they will one day be corrected. And and there are, you know, if if the House said we're going to impeach the president because we believe the president violated a federal statute, I think that would create an awful precedent. And insofar as there are some members of Congress that talk about it that way, I think they are, whether they realize it or not, not upholding their constitutional oath, and they should be criticized for that. Um, so I mean, yes, as a practical matter, they get they're the, they're the umpire, right? Um, but just like in a baseball game, um, the umpire may call something a strike, and we may have video that show that it wasn't. It counted as a strike for the game, but in an objective sense, it may not have been. I think we can, we'll be able, to, 45 years from now, we'll be able to assess whether or not the Senate did the right thing, or not, and the House did the right thing. And so, even if the outcome may not have, um, may have been the wrong outcome, I think we st it's not just whatever th they decide. And just what, I just want to address the point about not relying on crime, federal crimes, committing federal crimes as a basis for impeachment or removal. I actually agree with that. I don't think we need to uh, rely on, say, he violated this federal statute. I think in the language of crime, though, as a pragmatic matter, is might be necessary if there's any chance of getting a conviction, because that's how the public, I think, thinks of 
what's high crimes, what are high crimes, what are, what's bribery, and thinks in terms of, the, of, of criminal law. So even though I think we don't, you don't have to say, well, he met all these elements of the federal bribery statute, you can still use that framework. I think it's, it's, um, it's uh, helpful and useful to use that framework to frame the debate. And now I actually have to go. Okay, on that <laughs> uh, note. And I know before that before you leave the room, I will tell them I, I really disagree with that. I mean, there are a whole bunch of reasons, including the, the nature of the president's Article II power to decide what violations of criminal law should be prosecuted in the first place, that I think just make that that should be totally separate. I mean, may, politically, I have no idea what, what appeals to people right. politically, but I, I just don't think that should be on the table. We should be talking about it at a higher level than that because, for a whole bunch of reasons, including a real concern for re respecting what the president's legitimate Article II power is, which includes deciding what federal crimes should or should not be prosecuted. Well, I want to just thank Professor Oh, I know you have to run. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Professor Adler. Um, I They've both certainly given us a lot to think about, and I think if there's one thing we can all agree on is that there's no easy answers, and this is a very complicated process, so thank you. I don't, if you're willing to stick around for questions, I know there's some unanswered hands, so um, if you have questions, come on up, and hopefully we can answer them. Thank you very much for coming. Don't forget to sign up for the criminal law section. Woo-woo. Those are mostly corruption cases. I mean, you know, I mean... Uh, Good. Yeah, and there may be, and, and there may, you know, there may be things that relate to kind of pure corruption that we just don't He's have my evidence dad. of, right? I mean, in terms of emoluments <laughs> yeah. okay. and whatever else. He's doing well. Um, Thank you for asking. That's one of the reasons we have yeah. emoluments clause. Still kicking. Okay. Um, <laughs>